Good evening, everybody. I'm Franklin Institute Chief Astronomer Derek Pitts, your cool astronomer, welcoming you back for another edition of our Thursday night program, Night Skies at Home. Night Skies at Home is our home version of the Franklin Institute's Night Skies at the Observatory, a regular monthly program that we've been hosting at the Franklin Institute for quite a long time. And during this period of COVID-19 quarantine, we at the Franklin Institute are still cranking out content for you to make use of at home while we're all in quarantine. This is one of those programs. This particular program, of course, is about what? You guessed it. That's right. It's all about astronomy. And tonight, we're going to take another stab at the program we tried to do last week when we had some technical difficulties that made it a challenge for us to get the information to you that you need to know for how to rehabilitate your telescope and or how to buy a new telescope so that you can have something to help you observe the summer skies coming up this summer. This summer, we have really great sky viewing happening in the form of two or three of the brightest planets visible in the evening sky. I want to make sure that you get a good look at them because they're so satisfying to see the telescope. Jupiter, the largest planet of our solar system, and Saturn, the ringed planet of our solar system that everybody loves to see, along with Mars, will be visible throughout most of the summer. Right now, they're rising pretty late at night, 10.30, 10.45 or so, and they're up all night. But as the summer progresses, they'll rise earlier and earlier in the evening. So not only will you not have to be out very late at night, but you can also make them available to your surrounding neighborhood, if you like, of course, practicing the proper social distancing and give people a chance to have a good look at these really wonderful planets. So something you might consider for the summer, maybe not the neighborhood, but at least your family can get a good look at these objects. And that's supposing that you might have a telescope stuck in a closet someplace that was a gift or you purchased some time ago, but you never really learned how to use it. You never figured out how to use it, or maybe something's wrong with it that needs to be corrected. We're gonna help you with a few of those things tonight. And you might wanna have some information about what you might look for if you're considering purchasing a telescope. We'll give you some of that as well. And of course, we will take your questions about astronomy. So please send us your questions about astronomy. We love to get those and we love to answer those for you here. You know, the idea of this program is to help you become a crackerjack sky observer. Yes, you can do that without any difficulty at all. Many people think that it's difficult to learn about astronomy or learn the night sky, and it really isn't. The way it's typically presented is that you need to learn a whole suite of constellations that are available under a dark sky. And you really only have to do that one constellation at a time. And guess what? For those of us that live in an urban area, like around the greater Philadelphia area, the lights that are around the city at night make it a little bit more difficult to see a lot of what's available in the night sky, but we can still see the bright stars and the bright constellations. Well, guess what? That extra light acts as a filter. It takes away all of the background noise of the dimmer stars. I hope my friends in amateur astronomy will excuse me for describing the dimmer stars as background noise, but the point I'm getting to is that because you can see just the bright stars, it's easy to pick out the main constellations of the evening sky. And Anybody can do this. It's really, really easy. Think of it as a giant connect the dots game. Everybody's played that game. You know how it works. So all you have to do is memorize a single pattern, just one per night. And if you go out and identify that pattern, you can then connect that to the next pattern or to a pattern next door to it from a star map. And then you can go out and identify that. And so the process I'm describing is start with a star map, identify one star pattern, go out and identify that. Come back in, reward yourself, that's your work for the evening. And then the next night, look at your star map again, identify that same pattern, but one right next door also, now go out and look for the two. And if you do this night after night, when the sky is clear, when you're available to do it, in about two and a half to three weeks or so, you will have learned all of the constellations that are easily available for you to see. Then all you have to do is just follow that up with repetitions whenever the sky is clear. No, I don't mean spending three hours outside on a hot, muggy, bug-laden night. No, I mean just after sunset. The sky is just darkened 
and the breeze is kind of cool. You step outside under a clear canopy, uh, no canopy at all, actually, clear sky, look up and recognize the constellations that you've come to identify. If you do that repeatedly, guess what happens? In about a month, you'll become so familiar with them, you'll never forget them again, and you can recognize them no matter where you are on the planet. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward, right? Well, you can do that because astronomy, in many cases, can be that easy. Yes, there are lots of complicated parts and pieces to it, but guess what? You can get into those when you're ready. This program is meant to help you get started so that you can look like the astronomer royal of your neighborhood. And you can do that simply step by step with the simple guides and programs that I'm presenting as part of this. So stay with us and we'll learn all about that. So tonight, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take your questions. We're gonna scan around the sky to understand what's there at this time of year for this week, actually. We're gonna talk about telescopes. We're gonna take more of your questions and we'll finish off just by understanding all of the things that are available for us to see. Okay, so let's get started with some questions first and then we'll jump off and learn about telescopes. Helping me with this tonight, of course, is my executive producer over here, Linda. She's right over there, say hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. She's here with us doing the executive production stuff here, and she is uh, managing the questions for us. So what do we have first? How many telescopes do you have at home? <laughs> what a question. How many telescopes do I have here at home? You ready for this? At least a half a dozen. I probably have a couple more than that, and they're all sizes and shapes. So I have like this little like bird spotting scope that you see right here. Then over my shoulder on this side, I have a reflecting telescope, a small portable. Over here on this side, I have a smaller refracting telescope. And I have two or three very, very large instruments that I have here at home. Some of them are portable, some of them aren't, but they work in different ways and are, have different advantages to them for the kind of observing I want to do. But what can I say? I'm an astronomer, so I have lots of telescopes. Not everybody needs six telescopes. My wife doesn't even think I need six telescopes. But anyway, I have them just in case I need them for use. OK, what's another question? Oh, no more questions at the moment. So send us a question. Let us know what you want to know. Even though I'm going to talk about telescopes tonight, you may have heard some of it last week. We're going to make sure you get all the details you need to know. And in fact, I have a couple of folks that have written me just today to ask me about purchasing a telescope for travel. We'll talk about that too, okay? Joe, I think that was you. If you're in there, hi, welcome to the program. We'll answer your question as well. Okay, so send us your questions, whatever they are, even if it's not telescopes, we'll still answer, okay? Great, thanks for being with us. We really appreciate you being here. All right, so let's get started with what's happening in the sky. We'll run through that and then we'll jump into the telescope piece. Okay, first things first, we are now past the first day of summer. We've passed that portion of the year that we describe as the summer solstice. That was back last Saturday. We reached that solstice point at 534 in the afternoon. Well, you know, the solstice, that moment itself is just a moment in astronomical time. And it really describes a point in the Earth's orbit around the sun. Well, because we have already reached that point, it means that things are changing with sunrise and sunset times. If you want to learn a little bit more about this, I have a blog that I've written that's going to be published on the Franklin Institute's website in the not too distant future. And you'll be able to check out all of these really cool details about solstices, equinoxes, and about one other thing that's happening in just another couple of weeks. And that's called aphelion, aphelion. You'll find out about it when you read the blog. You'll find it on the Franklin Institute's website in the not too distant future. Um, just a little bit from now, you'll see it when you go there. Okay, great. Well, guess what? Here's the changes. Sunset, I'm sorry, sunrise now comes at 5.33 in the morning. Now, it's been that way for about a week. And the other thing that's happened is sunset is coming at 8.33. But catch this. We've already lost 15 seconds of daylight from yesterday. In other words, the day is now 15 seconds shorter today than it was yesterday. This is because we're after the, winter, the summer solstice. And guess what? Since Saturday, we've actually lost 41 seconds, almost a whole minute on the day. So what this means is you shouldn't waste time. You should get out and enjoy the summer now because one of the consequences of coming to the summer solstice is that we start to lose minutes of daylight. Okay, so before you know it, 
you're going to start to see that the sunsets are coming earlier. Now, unless you're up early in the morning, you won't notice that we're beginning to lose time in the morning as well. Sunrises will begin to come later in about a week. So if you keep your eyes tuned on this, you'll see how things are starting to shorten. Uh, so the next thing that's happening, of course, is the moon is now a waxing crescent. It's just about five days old. I think it's really 4.7 days old, but five days old for argument's sake. It rose today at 9.56 in the morning, and it sets after midnight tonight. It's uh, the new moon phase. Oh, uh, yes, right. So, so that's what's happening with the moon. You can get out and take a look for that. All right. What's great to see this week? Well, as I mentioned before, it's those fabulous planets, Jupiter and Saturn, along with Mars. Now, Jupiter and Saturn rising now at about 11 p.m., maybe a little bit before 11, and Mars around 2 a.m., so they're all well up in the southwestern sky by sunrise. Well, they're going to be pushing a little bit further west, which means that they will be rising earlier and earlier in the evening sky as we move into summer. Perfect opportunity for you to use that telescope on these really easy targets. Now, these three planets can be seen without a telescope and even without binoculars. You can see them with your naked eye. And in fact, you know, you could say that these objects have been observed by humans looking up at the sky since, well, I can't even put a date on it, since antiquity, for as far back as anyone can possibly imagine, even the earliest humans walking around at night could look up into the sky and see these objects and distinguish between planets and stars. And they used a very simple method that we still use today, actually, and it's this. It's very, very simple. You can tell the difference between planets and stars in the evening sky like this. Stars twinkle, but planets don't. Stars twinkle, but planets don't. So it's easy to tell the two apart if you use that way of distinguishing them. Stars twinkle, but planets don't. Okay? All right. So that's a cool thing to see in the sky. So let's hold it right there because we have some questions. Go ahead. What do we have? Do the cheaper telescopes work? Oh, the question is, do the cheaper telescopes work? Well, yes, they do. But the question is, how well do they work? And we're going to find that out. You know, when we talk about cheaper telescopes, I think maybe people are often thinking that perhaps uh, they've seen a telescope for $79.95 or maybe $39.95 or $99.95. Here's my first secret about telescopes. I don't know of a really good telescope for less than $150. I don't know of a good telescope for less than $150. Yes, there are telescopes you can purchase for less than that. But you're asking me, so I'm telling you the straight story. I don't know of a good telescope for less than $150. If you're gonna go in that direction, tell you what, go in a different direction altogether. Why not purchase a pair of really good binoculars instead and that way, you have some optical aid that will do double duty. You can look at the night sky, and you can look at objects on the planet as well. So, do cheap telescopes work well? They work. Do they work well? Eh, I don't think so. All right, let me go on to one other thing here about the sky. We'll come back and do another question. So, what's also available to see in the sky? There are three main constellations that are available right now. They are the constellations Lyra, Cygnus, and Altair. These are the three main constellations of the summer sky. And you can easily identify that because each one of them has one bright star. And they're arranged in a pattern that anyone can easily recognize. Here's a question for you. What geometric figure is created when you join three points with straight lines? What geometric figure is created when three points are joined with straight lines? Point to point to point to point. What do you think? If you said triangle, you're right. And in fact, these three stars together make up what's called the summer triangle. And the summer triangle is a large feature in the sky bound by these three point stars. And if you draw lines from star to star to star, you come up with a triangle. Well, here's the cool thing about those three stars. One of those stars is pretty close to us, 16 light years away. That means the light we see from the, that means that star is so far away. The light we see tonight left that star 16 years ago. One of the other stars is a little farther away. 
26 light years away, just 10 light years further. Not that bad, but guess what? The last one is how far away? 625 light years away. That's a long way off. You know what, I'm gonna check that number because I think that number is not right. I'm gonna check that number and make sure. I think it's farther away than that. But when you look at them in the sky, all three seem to be about the same brightness. Well, that tells us something about the stars themselves. If the one that's 2,600 light years away, which is how far that star is, by the way, 2,600 light years away, if that one looks as bright as the one that's 16 light years away, that means the really distant one must be a pretty big star in order to generate enough energy to look as if it's just 16 light years away. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, it's a really cool thing that you can observe in the sky without much difficulty at all, okay? All right, so let's hold on right there. We'll take another question. They're flooding in. Which is your go-to telescope? And seven-year-old Angela would like to know how far do telescopes see? Okay, two questions. What is my go-to telescope? I have to tell you, I'm really weak for a good refracting telescope. That's my favorite type of telescope. And the refracting telescope is one that has a lens at the front with the eyepiece at the back, like a long tube. That's the kind of telescope I really have a, a, a desire to use. I really like using those telescopes. I don't have anything against a good reflecting telescope. They're fine too, but my personal preference is the refracting telescope. Now, who was it again, hon? Angela. Angela. Angela asked the question, how far can a telescope see? She's seven years old. Angela, you're seven, I understand. That's a great question for a seven-year-old. Well, telescopes can see almost forever. They can see hundreds, even thousands of light years off into the distant universe without much difficulty at all. Telescopes gather light from dim objects and they collect that light and focus that light so that you can see the object better. And so Angela, what happens is even though light from stars is very weak by the time it gets to us, the telescope collecting that light allows us to see things very, very, very far off. So let me give you an example, Angela. A small telescope, even a small telescope under clear skies can see what's called the Andromeda galaxy. Now the Andromeda galaxy is a spiral galaxy just like ours, but it's a very long way away. It is 2.9 million light years away. Angela, that means that the light we see from that galaxy tonight left that galaxy almost 3 million years ago. That's how far away it is. But the telescope can see it. So we can see at least that far away and probably further. So they can see a long way. All right. So uh, you can try to get a look at the Andromeda galaxy yourself, Angela. You don't need a telescope. Binoculars will work well. Or if you're under a clear, dark sky, and I would recommend later this summer or early in the fall when Andromeda is easily visible early in the evening. What's another question? I have two grandsons, five and eight years old. What is a good telescope to buy for them? Okay, so here we go. The question is, I have two grandsons, five and eight years old. What's a good telescope to buy for them? Well, I have to be honest, maybe there isn't a good telescope to buy for five and eight year olds. And the reason why is because Telescopes require a little bit of dexterity to operate, and they also require some understanding of how the telescope itself works and how that motion connects it to the evening sky. So it takes a little bit higher age for that. But guess what? A telescope that I would recommend for a five and eight year old might be just about the right speed telescope for an adult. You get what I mean? Sometimes adults can't figure out how to use telescopes either. So a simple telescope is best. And what happens is you get a telescope that can be easily used and under adult supervision, an adult can help a five and eight year old see through the telescope well. And that's the real key, okay? So we're gonna look at one of those telescopes that I'm gonna recommend for a very, very simple use in just a few moments. We'll take one more question. Okay. What area nearby do you recommend as a good location to stargaze? And what's happening for the night sky in Chester? Aha, well, the question is, where would I recommend to be a good location to go view the night sky? Around this particular area, I should say it this way, all up and down the East Coast, we are awash 
with artificial light at night. If you take a look at a photograph of the United States from space at night, you can see how the East Coast is illuminated just as bright as can be. So that makes it really challenging for any of us on the East Coast to find a place where the sky is clear and dark. There are a few of those locations. If you're willing to travel, you can get to some dark sky locations. So let's do the nearby places first. For this particular region around the Philadelphia area, I have two recommendations. First of all, there's French Creek State Park, okay? French Creek State Park is not too far away from us, north and west of Philadelphia. And that's a great location because the skies are a bit darker there because you're out away from city lights. In the opposite direction, down to the southeast, you know the back way to Cape May? You know how you can go down the main highways and stuff like that? But if you go down the back way to Cape May, you actually end up going through the New Jersey farmlands. Well, it gets kind of dark down there. So I highly recommend that's another possibility. Excuse me one second. <coughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. If you go down that back way, you'll find some dark sky locations down there as well. Now, both of these locations are about 45 minutes outside of Philadelphia, so not far to go at all. The thing I like about the New Jersey sites, well, as it turns out, there are Wawa's along the way. And, you know, I'm weak for a cup of Wawa coffee and a donut, so for me, they're typically the most appealing kinds of places to go to. But I have one other suggestion I'm going to recommend. There's a really cool very new observatory out near Lancaster. It's called Muddy Run Observatory. It's at Muddy Run State Park. And I'm gonna recommend that you look up Muddy Run Observatory. Now it's about an hour away, a little bit more than an hour away from Philadelphia, but it really is worth it. Why? Because it is a modern observatory just recently built, one of the newest observatories on the East Coast, beautifully outfitted with great telescopes, and it's not too far outside the city. So look it up online, find out when they have an open house and make your way out there this summer and get a look through their instrumentation. Big screen. Okay, they also have a really cool big screen outside on which they can project various kinds of astronomy programs. And it's just a beautiful location. It's a great park and they have this great observatory and you can go check it out. Okay, all right, do that. All right, so one more question. Okay. Does the brand of the telescope or binoculars make a difference and reflective versus refractor? You said which one you choose. Aha. Uh -huh. Does the brand of telescope make a difference? Uh, well, very much like the way it makes a difference what brand car you buy these days. You know, I hate to, I hate to say it like this, but Ford and Chevy, excuse me for stepping on your toes, folks, but they're kind of interchangeable, sort of like the same way with telescopes. They all have the same kinds of features. They do the same thing slightly differently, but in a Ford or Chevy, can you get from home to downtown? Sure. In a telescope, whether it's Celestron or it's a Mead, can I see the North Star? Sure. It's just a question of what your preference is. What color do you like the telescope to be? Which features appeal to you most? They both have the same things. Typically, not much difference in terms of optical quality. Well, some would like to swear there are, but in this instance, I'll say no. However, there are custom telescopes that really are much better, but they get to be pricey. Okay, so this tells me it's time for us to move on and take a look at information about telescopes. We're gonna give you everything you need to know about purchasing a telescope. And I'm gonna do that with a slide presentation I have. So if you'll hang with me, I'm gonna pull this right over here. I'm going to share my screen. I'll adjust like this. I'm going to jump into screen share and we're going to go off and learn about telescopes. Here we go. Hold on. I'll make the little changes I need to make. Pardon me while I just clean things up. Here's my program right here. Let's get started. Uh, hold on. There we go. Now, I'll confess right off the top. This is a program that I've done before. I've used this program, as you can see, at my Night Skies at the Observatory program at the Franklin Institute. You see this says September 2018. Guess what? The information is pretty much still the same. Whatever has changed, I'll be sure to let you know of as we go through the program. But here we go. How to buy a telescope or avoid creating a monetary mini black hole of astronomy in a closet near you. 
you know, if you buy the wrong telescope, it just ends up in the closet and then you don't use it and you have a monetary mini black hole in a closet. So rather than that, let's make sure you get the telescope you need so that you can make use of it and not have wasted your time and money. So here we go with no boat anchors 101. Number one, find yourself a reputable dealer. I have some suggestions for that. We'll talk about them in just a minute. There are plenty of online resources and they give the most information you could possibly want in the fastest way possible. In fact, you can move along at your own pace to derive the information you'd like to know about what kind of telescope might be best for you. Somebody might want a telescope that's pretty good for just looking at stars and planets. Someone else might be interested in a telescope that's not only good for looking at deep sky objects like galaxies and nebulae, but you might want it to have the capability to take astrophotos as well. Well, that's a different kind of telescope. So you have to figure out how often you want to go out to view, how far you have to go from your home to a good observing location, or if you have a good observing location right at your home, you have to figure out how often you're going to do this. And you also have to figure out how much money you want to spend. That's a really important point. Oh, don't forget, you have to figure out how big a telescope you want. If you purchase a telescope that weighs 85 to 100 pounds, unless you're going to mount it in your backyard, like a really big telescope, if you're going to mount, if you, unless you're going to mount it in your own backyard, you're not going to use it very much. I can tell you that right now. So you need to purchase a telescope that you can transport easily to a dark sky location so you'll be sure to use it. It's a really important point. Astronomy magazines, they are very, very plentiful. And you'll find that those magazines have a lot of information, but those are mostly the telescope manufacturers that have big ad budgets, okay? So lots of big, pretty pictures and not really a whole lot of information or detail that you might need to know to help you do that. But here's something that's really important you can do. You can ask someone who owns a telescope, preferably someone who owns a good telescope. Your local planetarium, that would be me. Science Museum, hey, guess that's me again, right? Or Amateur Astronomer. And here in the Delaware Valley, we have a number of really, really top-notch amateur astronomy groups with members that would be more than happy to help you figure out what kind of telescope you need, okay? So keep that in mind. We talked about that a little bit before. We're now on to avoiding a dust collector, 101. Look for something you can handle. Like I said, don't get anything big if you can't move it. Bigger is not always better. If you can't move it, you can't use it. More bells and whistles will not make the telescope easier to use. That will just complicate things. So the more complicated or complex the operating system is, the less chance you're going to use it, unless you're really experienced already. If it needs a computer to operate, ugh, forget it. Why? Because you have to carry a computer with you to get the telescope to do what you want it to do, or it needs power, or it needs batteries. And I can almost guarantee you every time you take out a battery powered telescope to use it, you're going to forget that the batteries have depleted and you need new ones. Okay, there's still ways around that. And the big question of all, how much should I spend? Okay, so here's how you figure that out. Who's going to use it? Is it going to be an adult? Is it going to be a young person? How often is it going to be used? Every week, once a month, a few times during the year? And where will it be used? At home or someplace else? Now, here's a really important thing that you have to remember. Everybody thinks that the way you purchase a telescope is by the magnification. How much does this telescope magnify? 100 power, 500 power, 1,000 power. Is that what you're really after? Well, here's my rule of thumb. It goes like this. You can't magnify what you can't see. So telescopes work like this. They gather light from dim objects. They create an image that's then magnified by the eyepiece of the telescope. But if your telescope's lens or mirror isn't large enough to gather enough light to begin with, there's nothing to magnify. So don't go by magnification. Do not go by magnification. Nix on the magnification idea. Forget going by magnification. You want to go by the aperture or the size of the lens or mirror, the biggest you can afford. The biggest you can afford. So that's up to your individual preferences. Okay? Remember, you can't magnify what you can't see. 
And the power law that I've come up with is that you can get about 60 power of magnification per inch of aperture or diameter of the lens or mirror. Here's something very simple. If you have a one inch telescope, you can get about 60 power of magnification out of that one inch. If you have a two inch telescope, well, guess what? You can get about 120 power. If you have a three inch, you can get up to 180 power. Can you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, right. I'm not at the 500 power yet. If I want to get the 500 power, I've got to have a really big telescope if I want it to be clear and sharp. So it's not magnification you want, it's brightness and clarity of the image you want. Anything more than an eyeful in magnification is just wasted. Okay, let's move on. So what are the two kinds of telescopes? Well, there's the refractor telescope that has a lens on the front. And I have a great example of one of those right here. Here's a small refracting telescope I'm gonna take off of the tripod. This is like a bird spotting scope you can see here. Okay, so the lens is on the front end right here. You can see the big lens right here. If I can get in the right, yep, there's the big lens right there. And then the eyepiece is back here on this end here. Just so I can show you really quickly right here. Excuse me, that's my lens cap. Here's the eyepiece on this end. So this is a refractor, okay? Refractors are very simple. They simply take light in through the front lens. The shape of the lens bends the light and brings it down to a point right inside here where an image is created. And then the magnifying glass, which is the eyepiece, the eyepiece is nothing more than a magnifying glass. The magnifying glass then magnifies the image right here. So that's how all of these types of telescopes work. In my image here, this is a telescope of our Zeiss refracting telescope at the Franklin Institute. This is the telescope when it was in the Zeiss manufacturing shop in the early 1930s. This is what our telescope looks like, looked like when it was just being created. And it's a refracting telescope just like this one, okay? So that's one type. Then there's the reflecting telescope. And the reflect, reflecting telescope is like this telescope, oh, right here over my shoulder on this side. I'm gonna grab this and bring, grab this and bring this over so we can see this. This is the reflecting telescope. Now the reflecting telescope, instead of using a lens, uses a mirror, okay? So let me just show you how this guy works. Here we go. I'm gonna show you the mirror of the telescope. Here it is right here. Ah, oh, there we go. You can see the mirror down the barrel of the telescope there. See it in the background? Well, this is a reflector. Gathers light from dim objects, reflects that light back and forth inside the telescope tube, and then sends the light out through the eyepiece right here on the top end. The eyepiece, just like it does in any other telescope, is the magnifier of the image created by the main lens or mirror. So this is where all the magnification is. Right here in this piece, it's in the eyepiece. This is really important because this magnifies the image created by the telescope. So the telescope itself gathers the light to create the image. The eyepiece then magnifies the image. And what did I say before? 60 power per inch. It's light gathering versus magnification. That's what you'll get in any telescope. It's all the same. So here's a quick diagram that shows you what the interior of a telescope looks like. Let me uh, move this out of the way here. There we go, I'll get that out of the way. Here's the refracting telescope, the one I first showed you. Light comes in through the lens, goes down the tube, comes down to the eyepiece, and then you view right here where the eyepiece does all of the magnification. Although this diagram right down here is incredibly complicated, you don't really need to know all of that. What you need to know is that every refracting telescope basically works exactly the same way. If you can understand and operate one, you can understand and operate any of them, okay? All right, it's important to remember. Same thing is true for the reflecting telescope. Let's take a quick look. Oh, here's a slightly simpler diagram of the refracting telescope. Light comes in through the front lens because of the shape of the lens, the light rays are bent. They come down, they pass through the focal point right here, and they go through the eyepiece. And the eyepiece then has magnified the image so that you can then view it as you look through the telescope. Okay, so that's the quick one on that. Let's move on to the reflecting telescope. Oh, I see I have one more here. So there's the simplest diagram of all. Light comes in, goes down, reverses, comes out the eyepiece where you view. Now, 
This, by the way, is the reason why objects in a refracting telescope appear upside down. Imagine this is the top light ray here, and this is the bottom. They go through the lens, invert at this point, and now what was the bottom light ray from the object you're viewing has now become the top. So now the image is inverted. That doesn't really matter. If you're looking at an object in space, there's no up or down anyway. And in fact, uh, you know, it really wouldn't help if you added another lens just to reverse it. You might lose some of the light you're trying to gather anyhow. So the viewer here sees a brighter, clearer, now magnified image because of what the eyepiece does to magnify things. All right, let's move on here. Here are the reflecting telescopes. Very, very simple reflecting telescopes use a main mirror right here on the back end and they gather light from whatever object is out in front of the telescope out this way. Light comes down the tube, reflects off of the mirror, comes up to a second mirror that then sends the light out through the eyepiece here on the top of the barrel. Same principle, lights gathered, image is created, eyepiece magnifies the image. It's all very simple. Every reflecting telescope works the same way. If you understand how one reflecting telescope works, you understand and can operate any reflecting telescope. Okay, maybe I'm slightly glossing over some of the complications that can arise in a reflecting telescope, but the basic principle of how they work remains the same no matter how complex the telescope is, and you can understand it. There's no reason why you can't, so don't feel intimidated by how a telescope is set up. So here's a similar image using the same kind of illustration. Light comes in through the telescope, reflects off of the mirror, bounces off the secondary mirror that shoots it up to the eyepiece, and then the magnified image comes out here where you observe it. Very simple. All right, let's now get on to the other part about this. Here's another slightly different design for a reflecting telescope called a Dobsonian. Don't worry about the name. It's the same basic kind of telescope it's just built out of parts that you can get at any home repair or supply store, home equipment supply store. All you have to do is provide the optics and then you can build this. This is called the Dobsonian design. And the cool thing about this design is that you can build your own big telescope for a relatively cheap price. But I digress. It looks like this. Here's a really big one, obviously home built, and it can work really, really well for you. But remember, you'd have to transport something that size in order to make it really useful for you. So if you're looking for something for home, here are some things to remember. Refractors are pretty cool. They are more expensive. They are less compact. They have this thing called chromatic aberration which has to do with how the colors in an image align, but most refractors take care of that pretty well these days. And you might have reduced light gathering simply because you can't build a refractor as big as you can build a reflector for as low a price. But here's the one thing about reflectors, it, because it's a mirror, they can't see space vampires. Okay, it's a little astro humor there, okay? All right, bear with me. All right, moving along, let's keep going. Okay, so now, here's that really important part of the telescope that I mentioned before, eyepieces. Eyepieces come in various sizes. And the sizes are rela related to what's called their focal length, the distance of their magnifying power, if you will, the distance of their magnifying power. And because they come in different lengths of that, they have different magnifications. So the way you change magnification in, an, in a telescope is you change the eyepiece, you change the magnifying power by changing the eyepiece. So an eyepiece like this one, that has this little number on the side that says 26 mm, that's millimeters. That's the focal length of this particular eyepiece. That number being so big will give you low power of magnification, but a wide field of view. If we go all the way down to the end and come to this 7.4 millimeter eyepiece, that one will give you much higher magnification, but it will also give you a much tinier field of view and it will be really challenging to use that particular eyepiece. The bigger eyepiece, the 26 millimeter, is much simpler to use. Eyepieces also come in different optical designs. 
as you become more advanced in the use of telescopes and eyepieces, you might choose a more sophisticated optical design for your eyepiece. But something like the Nagler eyepiece, which is very sophisticated and extraordinarily good quality, is also extraordinarily expensive. So that may not be the way you want to go just to begin. But I'd recommend a good Plossel eyepiece, particularly these days of social distancing. And the reason why is because with this design eyepiece, the Plossel design eyepiece, you don't have to have your eye right on the eyepiece. It has what's called good eye relief. And that's the distance your eye is from the eyepiece itself. On this other one here, the Kellner, well, the funny thing that astronomers say about this one is that the eye relief is so short, you have to be so close to the eyepiece, it's almost like you have to crawl inside the eyepiece to use it efficiently. Just a saying that goes with that. So let's go on because there are some other parts here. Uh, this is the other important part of the telescope, and that's the tripod. You know, the first rule of building uh, construction is to provide a good foundation. And even if you have really, really good optics, those good optics are no substitute for a bad tripod. So you need a really good and stable tripod to make your telescope perform really well. Don't forget that. That's something else you want to look for. And you might want to take the telescope for a test drive, something that you're interested in purchasing. So ask somebody who owns a telescope if you can try theirs. Where can you do this? Local astronomy clubs. Why don't you join a local astronomy club? Most of them actually have loaner telescopes that you can borrow so you can figure out what kind of telescope you might like to buy before you purchase it, okay? All right, now, here's some alternatives. Guess what? If you're not sure about which telescope to buy yet, you might start with a nice pair of binoculars. I always advocate binoculars because they can be less expensive. In this particular instance, here's a set of binoculars that have a magnification of 20 power and a front lens size of 80 millimeters. That means it's three inches in diameter. So you essentially have two three inch telescopes side by side with 20 power magnification for $150. Not bad, except you'll need a tripod for these because you can't hold the set of binoculars this big. You can't hold them steady. So you need a tripod for that. So that's a way you might go. But let's get on to some other suggestions I have. So here we are. This is one of my favorite dealers for purchasing telescope equipment. It's called the Orion Telescope Center. And I'll show you, here's their website right here, telescopes.com. I really like Orion because while they have a large variety of telescopes and accessories and everything you could need, they also have really, really good education for helping you figure out what kind of telescope is great for you to buy. I highly recommend going to their website to look at the array of equipment that's available. You can find every kind of telescope you might think you want, and you can streamline your search by putting in the parameters that you might want to purchase in a telescope, how much you want to spend, how big you might want it to be, whether it's a reflector or a refractor. And if you use their little information centers that they have on their website, you can learn everything you need to know in detail so you can understand what kind of telescope you might like to purchase. I highly recommend them. They ship their material right away to this portion of the country. They're in California, but they have a web, they have a warehouse here in Pennsylvania. So you can get equipment right away. I purchase a lot of equipment from them because they're so good. So they have all sorts of deals you might be able to look for. And if you go to their website, you'll find a lot of that stuff. But guess what? there's actually a local vendor right here in the Delaware Valley. In Pottstown, there's this great place called Skies Unlimited. It's a retail store that sells telescopes and telescope equipment. They're right here in the Delaware Valley and the folks that run this place and work there really know their stuff. So if you wanna to go to a place and actually see what you might be purchasing rather than doing it all online, go out to this location and there you can actually see what's available to purchase and you can purchase directly through them. So I highly recommend you give our local folks a shake too and run out there and take a look at what they have. They're online at Skies Unlimited. You can find out what they have for sale too. And you can get good advice from them as well. Highly recommend it. Okay, so remember I said there are two types of telescopes, refractor and reflector. One uses a lens, one uses a mirror. Now you're gonna ask me which one is better for what? 
okay? Here's how it goes. The refractor is better for point sources of observing, planets and individual stars, okay? Reflectors are better for objects like galaxies and nebulae. Both will show all of the objects, but as it turns out, reflectors allow you to buy a larger telescope, more light gathering power for less than a refractor will cost. So in other words, the refractor, while it's a great telescope, costs much more money to build a big one, six inch, seven inch, eight inch and more. A good one of those, a good one, is somewhere between 800 and and $1,000 per inch of aperture. I'm not saying there aren't more affordable ones. Yes, there are. If you go to the Orion website, you'll see that there are plenty of them. And I'm gonna talk about another one of those in just a moment. But the reflector will give you more bang for your buck. You can buy a larger reflector for the same amount of money as a refractor telescope. And the Dobsonian gets you even more value because the Dobsonian telescope is even less expensive. That's because of its very simple design. So I highly recommend you go in that direction. But they all have their trade-offs. And if you learn more about them, you'll understand what some of those trade-offs are. Okay, if you have a telescope at home that you've been trying to figure out how to get to use, well, here's one of the first things you can try on that. Let me stop my screen share here. Uh, I think I've exhausted what I want to show here. Oh yeah, by the way, everybody wants a telescope like this, don't we? This is the 200 inch reflecting telescope at Mount Palomar, California. And gee, wouldn't I love to have that in my backyard? Oh, guess what? Just a little bit of information, trivia information about this big telescope, the 200 inch Hale reflector. You see the superstructure of the telescope, all of this stuff right in here? This was built by General Electric, a General Electric plant right here in the Delaware Valley. Yep, our imprint from Philadelphia is on one of the world's largest telescopes. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, well, let's get out of this because now I wanna show you one other thing. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this. Let me just end this program right here, get rid of that, here we go. I'm gonna share one more thing with you here. I'm gonna go back to my screen. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, let me just move some things around here so I can get to where I wanna go. That's where I am, I'm right over here. Here we go, great. One question that's come in is, what's a simple telescope I can recommend? I'm gonna go with this one. Let me go out to the website and show it to you. Here it is. Let me get my thumbnails out of the way. This is the Orion Star Blast II 4.5 inch equatorial reflector telescope. You can see the price on this is $179.99. I like this telescope. It's small, it's portable, it has everything you need on it to be a telescope that you can learn how to use easily and it's transportable. The optics on this are gonna be pretty good. Orion stands behind their equipment. This is a good example of something you could consider purchasing. So why don't you do a screen grab of this so that you can have this information as a starting point for where you might jump off on your search for a telescope that might work for you, okay? I like it, it's a good one, it'll work for you. There are certainly larger ones, there are smaller ones, maybe the price point is too high, you can find something cheaper, you can pay more if you want, you can buy the most expensive telescope in the world if you like, but if you don't know how to operate it or it doesn't fit your needs, you still won't use it. So you really have to figure out what your needs are before you do that, okay? So there's that telescope. For those of you that were asking, what's a telescope that I can purchase that's rather inexpensive, but might be suitable for someone to use as a beginning telescope? Well, here's a good example of one of those that you might consider, okay? So give that a shot. Now let me go back to something else. I was just about to say earlier, I'm gonna stop that share right there. I was gonna say earlier that if you have a telescope in a closet that you need to get out and figure out how to use again, well, there are lots of aids available to you to make that happen. So one of the things you can do is if you've lost your instruction manual, you can go online and find the instruction manual online. All you have to do is look at the label on your telescope to tell you who the manufacturer is and what the model is. And you can search up the instruction guide to help you figure out how to use it again. Also, if there are parts and pieces missing, 
you can figure out which ones they are and you can order replacement parts. Now telescopes, mechanically speaking, are actually relatively simple. So it's not too hard to replace a piece on a telescope if you're very careful about it. And guess what? You know that YouTube nowadays has instructions for doing just about everything. So if you need to figure out how to replace a piece on your telescope, you can do that too. You can also always send me an email and you can ask me how to help you figure out how to replace a piece on your telescope. More than happy to help you do that, okay? Now, here's one of the simplest reasons why your telescope at home in the closet probably doesn't work. It has to do with a piece on the telescope that's extraordinarily important. And I'm gonna show you that piece right now. I'm gonna use my refractor over here from this side to show it to you. Oh no, I'm not gonna use my refractor. I'm gonna use my reflector. Many telescopes have a little tiny telescope off on the top side. You can see I have a small one right here that goes with my big telescope right here. Well, this is called a finder scope. And the finder scope is used to help you locate the section of sky that you want to observe. It helps you to acquire the target you want to see through the main telescope, but it does so using a low power, wide field of view, tiny little telescope. And that's what this is. This is just a small telescope, low power, wide field of view. This helps you get the object you really wanna study into the field of view that the telescope can see. So once you can see it in the center of the finder scope, you're supposed to be able to see it in the main telescope. But here's what happens. The finder scope often gets displaced somehow. So on this particular instrument, you'll see that my finder scope is kind of loose. So I need to do some repair work. But you know what happens in your home telescope? This becomes misaligned. This tube and this tube are not aligned together. And that's a problem. How do you fix it? Very simple. Take your telescope outside during the day. Point the telescope at an object that's some distance away, like the top of a flagpole or the top of a tree, and find that object in your main telescope. Use the lowest power eyepiece you have and find that object in your main telescope during the day, not at night. Now what you do is once you have it found here, you then use the tiny little screws on top of the finder scope to align the finder scope to what the main telescope sees. Now this telescope and this telescope are aligned. So when you go outside at night, when you point the telescope using your finder scope and you get the object centered right here, it will be findable or visible in the main telescope. You can't do this the other way around, folks. It doesn't work. And the reason why is because this is low power wide field. This is high power narrow field. And if you've ever heard the saying, set, if you've ever heard the saying, hunting for a needle in a haystack, well, that's what it's like trying to find an object in the sky using your main telescope to find it rather than using the finder scope. So this is probably the main reason why your telescope at home doesn't see what you want it to see, because the telescopes aren't aligned. The finder and the main telescope aren't aligned. The second thing is out of focus. So you need to make sure you have all of your eyepieces together and you need to test focusing your telescope outside during the day first. That way you know it's focused when you go out to use it at night. Those are the two main reasons. Following that, the third one is your telescope tripod is broken or wobbly. If you can fix those things, your telescope will still work for you. You don't have to worry about cleaning the lens. You don't have to worry about cleaning the mirror. Just make sure you have the eyepieces, make sure the finder is aligned, and make sure the tripod is in good shape. Those three things will get you looking at the sky right away. And I recommend you start with the moon. Always start with a big bright object, a big bright target. Start with the moon. Folks, there's so much I could tell you about telescopes and we don't have the time to do all of that here, but I hope what I've given you is just a beginning sort of sense of what you can think about when you're thinking about purchasing a telescope or what you might have to do to rehabilitate your telescope that you'd like to get out of the closet and use. If you have a telescope in the closet, you're trying to figure out how it works or what's wrong with it, take a picture of it and send it to me. Explain to me what you think the problem is and I'll help you figure out how to fix it. Or I can direct you someplace where you can get it fixed. So let me know and I'll be glad to help you with that. If you wanna ask me a question about purchasing a telescope, 
please feel free to send that along too. I'll be happy to help you with that as well. And I can point you to some other websites where you can get more information or you can find other telescopes. There are plenty of telescopes available at the price point you're interested in set and purchasing and uh, of the type that will work best for you. And that's really important to get what you need. Okay, so we've done plenty with that. I hope that's been very helpful. And uh, hopefully that'll get you on the way to purchasing a telescope that will work for you. Okay, last but not least, before we head out, just to make sure that you have what you need to understand the night sky. Oh, just a second, here we go. I hit the wrong button. All right, let me just get to where I need to be here. And what am I gonna do? Here we are, just like this. Okay, let's just take a quick tour around the sky so you can see where those objects are you need to see. Of course, I'm using Stellarium Web, which is an online uh, sky planetarium or home, home planetarium program that allows you to see the night sky. You've seen this before, I've used it. You can easily access it just by going to stellarium-web.org. And uh, let's start out by moving the sky around. I'm just panning around the sky to get us set up for viewing. I'm looking out toward the south. You can see the letter S for south here. This is set at about 10 o'clock at night after the sky is dark. And I'm gonna get rid of the horizon atmosphere to make the sky as dark as possible. And there we go. We can see what's available to be seen in the evening sky on this date at 10 p.m. Hey, check it out. There's Jupiter over in the southwestern portion of the sky, just southeastern side of the sky, just poking its head up above the horizon. Let's see what constellations are available here. Ah, here we are. And guess what? Here are the three constellations I mentioned earlier. Now, I'm just going to turn us around a little bit more to the east here so we can see them. These are the three main constellations of the summer sky. Lyra, right up here. Cygnus, right over here. And Aquila the Eagle, right here. I don't think I mentioned their names before. But these three stars, these three bright stars, make up the summer triangle. And by 10 PM, they are well up above the eastern horizon. Vega is the one that is 26 light years away. Aquila the Eagle right here, this bright star called Altair is actually 16 light years away. And this guy right here, Deneb in Cygnus, in Cygnus is 2,600 light years away, 2,600 light years away. We see the light as it appears. We see tonight's light that we see from that star left 2,600 years ago. Vega's light left 26 years ago and Altair's light left 16 years ago. So these three stars together make up the summer triangle. And the cool thing is, if you follow right along the axis of these constellations, it'll take you right along the Milky Way, the arms of our galaxy that you can see without any difficulty at all. So a star map like this can help you figure out what constellations are available to be seen and where you can look around the sky. And of course, the cool thing is you can manipulate it in any way that you want. So you can find out all kinds of cool information about all of the stars that are visible there. So if you'd like more information, for example, about Vega, if you just click on it, you'll get a box that gives you the information you'd like to have about that particular star, okay? So here's a really good one to use. Okay, let's uh, finish out the evening with some more questions. We'll let this, we'll just give this a chance to take a break here and we'll finish out with some more questions. What do we have? Are there astronomy clubs that I can join to go stargazing? Yes, you don't have to go stargazing by yourself. You can go with other members of other uh, astronomy clubs, and there are a number of them around the Delaware Valley. I actually think that I have posted on the Franklin Institute's website someplace a list of what the astronomy clubs are around the Delaware Valley that are left over from a program I did about a month and a half ago now on this evening program. So if you go on the Franklin Institute's website, you can find the blogs that I posted, and you'll find a list of the astronomy clubs around the Delaware Valley. Folks are really enthusiastic. They hold public star parties and they actually have members only star parties. So you can go out and you can scan the skies, enjoy the skies with some really experienced sky observers who have great telescopes. And they are always willing to share fabulous information and they have plenty of it. So uh, in your neighborhood, in your location, wherever you live, there's an astronomy club not too far from you where you can get really, really great information. What's next? 
What telescope is best to use for digital imaging? Well, it really depends what kind of telescope, what kind of digital imaging you want to work, uh, want to use. I'd actually recommend a reflecting telescope. And the reason why is because with a reflector, you can gather much more light for a much lower price. And in astrophotography, it really, really helps to have as much light as you can get. Now, in truth, today, the digital cameras that are available uh, can have very, very high what are called ISO speeds. And that's something that would normally refer to the, let's say it's the speed of acquisition or accepting photons from an object. Now you can set an ISO really high and gather a tremendous amount of light from an object, but still doesn't hurt to have uh, a good amount of uh, light gathering capability on your telescope. So I'd recommend a reflecting telescope for that. Just make sure you find one that's portable enough for you to use and at the right price point for you to make sure you continue to use it. What's next? Do astronauts use telescopes on space stations? Do astronauts use telescopes on space station? Typically, no, but they do have a telescope mounted on board space station. They typically don't use it for looking at the night skies, though. You know, it'd be great to take more time to observe the night sky, and they do a little bit of that, but they don't really study the night sky using telescopes they have on board space station. And the reason why is because space station is a moving platform. So for a little bit of pleasure observing, yes, but for astronomical research, not very often. They're there is instrumentation, astronomical research instrumentation mounted on the exterior of space station, and that gets used for real astronomical research. But they typically don't have a telescope that they can use, like we might use a telescope here on it. What's next? What size telescope is best to look at Saturn? What size telescope is best to use at Saturn? I would recommend something anywhere between three inches in diameter and up to six inches in diameter. That's a great size for observing because that's small enough to be portable, yet big enough to give you good light gathering capability. Here's a little secret. In 1610, when Galileo first turned a telescope toward the sky to look at Saturn, his one inch, one inch lens gave him a view of Saturn. It wasn't the greatest view, but he could still see Saturn and identify the features we now call rings. He didn't know what they were, but he could at least see those rings. Now, in any telescope you purchase today, no matter how bad the telescope is, you'll at least be able to see the rings of Saturn. But don't get the worst telescope you can find. Get one that makes a lot more sense for what kind of viewing you want to do. So I'd say at least three inches, up to as many as six, and that'll be a comfortable price and also be easier to transport. If you want to go in the direction of a reflecting telescope, Go with the largest size Dobsonian you can afford and you can transport. And then that way you'll get satisfying views of everything, including Saturn. What's next? Last one. Your family can look for a lot of light to know at what age get your first good quality telescope. Hi, Nathaniel from North Carolina. You're asking at what age did I get my first good quality usable telescope? Wow. Well, I have a little secret for you. My brother, who's about five years older than I am, actually got a telescope when we were kids. I would bet I was seven and he was maybe 12, or I was six and he was 11, something around that. Well, this was a telescope made by the Gilbert Company. Anybody who's a big kid like I am might remember the Gilbert Scientific Company. It was an okay reflecting telescope. I learned how to use it, but the skies where I lived weren't all that great. Anyway, it was a while before I actually got a really good, useful telescope. And I have to tell you, I'm spoiled. I really am. Because the first really, really good telescope I acquired for use was the Franklin Institute's 10-inch Zeiss refractor. Yes, yes, yes. I know that's cheating. You know, that's really big and really professional. But the family, you can find a telescope. Someone can help you find a telescope that'll work well for you, that's affordable, and relatively easy to use. So if you go by the guide that we talked about this evening, some of the guides we talked about this evening, I'm sure we can find something. I'm sure you can find something that will work for you down there in North Carolina. Thanks a lot for the question, Nathaniel. I greatly appreciate it. OK, folks, we've been through a lot this evening. We were able to talk about telescopes and how to purchase a telescope, what to look for, places you can go to find out information, and how you can rehabilitate the telescope you have in your closet. I hope that information is helpful to you. Next week, we're going to talk about online and robotic observatories. 
Yes, you can use telescopes and observatories online, so you don't have to go to a remote location. You can use a big telescope someplace else, or you can find out what those big observatories are doing under their domes, wherever they're located, anywhere else around the planet. So we'll do that. So remember, folks, it just takes a few minutes every day to catch up with the night sky. It's not how much weight you lift at one time if you're going to the gym to build muscle. You don't want to lift 500 pounds at a time. What you want to do is instead lift five pounds and do reps over and over again. And that's what learning the sky is about. You learn a little bit of information and you add to that every day with a little bit more. And before you know it, you'll know enough to share with the folks in your neighborhood and in your family as well so that you can help with a really calm, relaxing, observing experience during this time of the pandemic um, protocols that make us now uh, sort of stay inside during quarantine. The weather is nice, we wanna get outside. This is a great thing you can do right at home, right in your own neighborhood with your family uh, to enjoy something that's really cool, learning about the night sky. Thanks a lot for the great questions. I really appreciate it. We'll be back next week. Hopefully you'll join us then. So thanks for joining us. If there's anything that COVID-19 has taught us, it's that science really matters. And as we are learning every day, science is so important more and more and more every day. We're seeing evidence of that. So even while the Franklin Institute is closed, we're finding new ways to continue to bring you quality content and information in so many different branches of science that we hope you find interesting. Everywhere from videos to activities to hands-on things to programs like this to help you learn more about science and become more proficient at science and have more fun with science. If you're able, we would really be grateful if you would consider donating to the Franklin Institute today or really any other day. We really do value and appreciate your support and we look forward to having you back at the Franklin Institute soon, but if you can see your way clear to making a donation, we'd really greatly appreciate that. So thank you for joining us tonight. We hope to see you again next week. Get out and enjoy the night sky while we have this great, warm, pleasant weather. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Jupiter over in the southeast sky just after 10 o'clock. Saturn rising along right behind it, both up well in the southeast by midnight. And you certainly will enjoy them as you will enjoy observing the moon too. Something easy for everybody to see. Don't forget, check out our other Franklin Institute programs on Franklin at Home at the Franklin Institute's website, fi.edu. And you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Cool Astronomer. You can send me questions there. I'll be happy to answer you as well. Remember folks, stay safe, maintain that social distancing, and we'll get through this eventually. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks for joining us. So long and enjoy the skies. Remember, it's your universe. Get out and explore it.